So good to see each one of you here this morning. Uh, God is good, amen. Are you ready for the word this morning? Yes. <laughs> Some of it might be a little, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a warning. Some of it might be a little bit rubbing on the shoulders, right? Uh, in the sense of, might be the Holy Spirit and the Lord speaking to us. And because the Bible, the Word of God is, is for reproof, for correction, for doctrine, and all of that, right? And so that we may be made righteous before presented to God, perfect. And I said this before, you know, that, um, you know, a lot, I, I used to, when I was growing up, I used to hear this term all the time, it's like, well, you can go from church to church and you'll never find a perfect church. Yes, the perfect building, the pe people in there, but you know what? Jesus is coming back for a perfect church, a perfect bride, without spot and without blemish. And so we gotta be, we gotta work towards it. And like last week I talked to you all about the way to the Father, to the Father's heart. Jesus, Jesus was telling the disciples and preparing their hearts. And so today we're going to continue on that pathway. All right? Thanks. Well, let's just get into the word right now. Let's lift our Bibles up and declare what we believe that we hold in our hand. It says, I believe that my Bible is a living word of God. It inspires me, it guides me, and leads me in timeless truth. It has the authority to save me and to deliver me. It has the power to heal me, to restore me, and set me free. Excuse me. Well, praise God. I am excited for this because during conference, um, the last uh, day on Sunday, Pastor Sudarshan started off and he was talking and he was about the vine and he touched a little bit on the vine and the branches and he talked about it that there's a cost involved, there's a fact, cost factor and, you know, uh, the suffering that has to go along with it. And so, so I'm continuing from last week, what we talked about last week um, with, with the disciples, with Jesus talking and telling the disciples the way to the Father, Jesus was trying to show them a way and he was telling them that, and I'm going to run through the points real quick uh, for you this morning so those that were not here can catch up, is is expectation and it's John chapter 14 verses uh, 1 to 31 that whole chapter that was the first point we expect we're expecting something Jesus said I go and prepare a place for you that there is much room in my father's house he was saying so there's an expectation he was telling the disciples to be ready for this revelation the revelation was saying that he that I am the truth and the life Believe in the words of Jesus. He was asking them to believe in their words. Believe in his words. If you don't believe in that I am the Father and the Father is in me, then he says, then at least believe for the signs and wonders that you see. And he was telling them to believe. Jesus' response, the point number four, was to his disciples when the disciples like Thomas and Philip began to question and ask and say, we don't know where you're going because he said, I, I go, I'm going away, I'm going to leave you. And, and I'm, my Father in heaven is going to send you the, the Holy Spirit and he will lead you and guide you and be with you. And they didn't understand that because they were wanting a kingdom here on earth. And while he was sharing our stuff, they began to say, why? Show us the way. And they were asking him. And he says, I am in the Father and the Father's in me. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. And so 
That was Jesus' response to them. He said, believe, believe in the signs and wonders. Believe in the miracles that you see. And then the privilege of our privilege of prayer that we come to him, he says, I tell you the truth, that if anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done. He says, I'm leaving. You will do the same works. And we talked about how the greater works that, that Jesus had mentioned to the disciples, that he performed water and into wine and the woman with the issue of blood and the centurion servant and raised Lazarus from the dead and delivering the demons uh, out of the man who was out in the wilderness. All of that great miracles but when the power of the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples when they were asked to go and tarry to wait in Jerusalem in the upper room and the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to do greater works. Because as we read in, in the book of Acts. That, that Peter's shadow. People were bringing and lining up people on the pathways on the streets. That as Peter walked the shadow fell on them. And they would be touched and healed and delivered. And from all of that. Paul in the book of Acts uh, chapter 19 was the cloth that was upon him, the handkerchief and the scarves that were on him, his, his robe, portions of it, is that they were cutting that and they were sending that to people. Greater works that he was, that was being performed. And I read to you a line that I'll read to you now again, talking about faith. It is because of our faith. We need that. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. It says faith shows us the reality of what we hope for. And the evidence of things we cannot see. Faith sees invisible. Believes the incredible. And receives the impossible. Amen. Do you say amen to that if you believe that? Because it is faith. What is your faith? Where's your, what's your level of faith? You know, it's like each one of us is given a measure of faith. And we activate it and we believe in it. Jesus said, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. <laughs> believe in me. So faith is invisible. Sees the invisible. Excuse me. Sees the invisible. Believes the incredible. What is the incredible things that you're expecting and wanting to see happen physically in your life, spiritually, outside of your life, whatever it is, in your workplace, Wherever it is. I know there's some things that I am believing God for. And so believing for the incredible. And faith receives the impossible. Because it's impossible to please God without faith. The Bible says. Amen. And so this morning we're going to continue in chapter 15. And some of you may may be very familiar with this passage of scripture because it's spoken a lot and it's, and it's talked a, uh, about a lot. And the title of my message this morning is called The, the True Vine. True Vine. The scripture reading is from John chapter 15 verses 1 to 8. And once again, I got the title of my message from the top heading of this passage. It says, Jesus, the true wine, vine. And so, let's go ahead and read this. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message that I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. And you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit for apart from me. You can do nothing. We heard that this morning a couple of times in our prayers. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like 
a useless branch and with us. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I am the vine and you are the branches. Verse 5. The, the one who remains in me, Jesus says, and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. This passage deals with the intimate living relationship that believers share with Jesus Christ. Believers as God's branches, that's what we are, Christians. We are God's branches that are vitally connected to Jesus, who's the vine. We sang that song this morning, Jesus at the center of it all. Where, where is the vine? It grows from the ground up, and it's in the middle. It's in the center of it all. The branches are branches. They branch out from the vine. And so it's right in the center. And that's what, that's what, uh, that's what, that's what we are as believers. As a result, we draw our life, our source, our strength from Jesus Christ. So, the promise of this text is that in an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, we bear much fruit, which what? Brings the Father glory and honor. Yes. 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 We love that. We love that. But he says, but without him, mm -hmm. without me, you can't do anything. You can't. Amen? So there are some powerful lessons from this passage for us as believers this morning in the scripture. And I got a few points. There's about four points that I want to hit this morning and give it to you. So the first one is Jesus is the true source of your life. Jesus is the true source of your life. Here we have another great one that he says, I am. Remember last week we read, I am the truth, the way, and the life. I am the vine. What's he trying to say? He's reaffirming to us that when God spoke to Moses and said, you know, and he says, well, how am I going to tell the children, uh, the Pharaoh to let my people go and he said who said that and he says I am with you and he says tell them the great I am sent you he's continuing to emphasize he's continuing to inform the disciples that he is with the father and the father is with him there is no separation there is no difference Jesus is ex expressing that to them He's connecting the dots for them because all they're looking for is for a palace, for a kingdom on earth that Jesus was going to rule and they would be his knights in shining armor, so to speak. No. Jesus talked of the vine. His listeners in those days ex knew exactly what he meant because the vine became the symbol of the nation of Israel. I was so glad that this morning that when Pastor Cheryl um, opened up the prayer, recognizing this first day of the new year in the Jewish calendar. It's important for us. We're connected. We're grafted to the family of God through Jesus Christ as Gentiles. It was an emblem for, on their coins of Maccabees, the vine. 
It was a great treasure and glory of, uh, of the, uh, at the temple. The temple that was built where they went into the place to worship the holy place. It was right in front of the uh, engraving of the vine. It was constantly a symbol before them to never forget that they had to be connected to the vine. So when Jesus calls himself the, the true vine, he is saying that I am the vine of God and you must be the branches joined to me. That's what he is telling his disciples. And it is not because you belong to Israel, it's not because of the tribe that you are saved, but it is by faith in me as a true source of life that you get through the vine. Jesus was trying to tell them and teach them this. Trying to give it very crystal clear to them, the story. So what is the significance? If you want to write that question down, you can write it down. What is the significance of this truth for us? Because Jesus is the true source of life. That's simple. Sometimes, you know, we as pastors and theologians, we, can, we try to complicate the gospel too much. Too much. He just says, I am the vine. You are the branches. And if you look at the vine, and I have a grape, grape vine at the house, and it's growing, and we got a few bunches of grapes on it, and things like that, they are not very edible, but it's there because it's the first year of the fruit. But I know the fact that we continue to trim it and prune it, and so it's beginning to bear fruit. And it looks elegant, it looks good. But the true vine, there's a source. When you're connected to the source, you know, you're nourished, you flourish. The source of life is Jesus Christ. Point number two, life results from being connected to Jesus. You have results in your life when you're connected to Jesus. We draw our life through Christ, as Paul says in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being when we are connected to him, connected to Jesus. Common sense tells us that you don't get oranges on an apple tree, right? Strawberries on, on pear trees. We don't see that. Because each tree, plant, bears its own fruit. So it is frustrating for me sometimes when I think or when I see, you know, the fact is that it's impossible to try to live a Christian life if you are not connected to the source. It's impossible. Because Jesus says that it's impossible. You cannot do anything. So what we have to do is believe and connect with them. The life you were created to live is impossible to see. Realize without Jesus. Jesus in your life. Jesus the center of it all. Jesus at the center of your life. Jesus in the center of your marriage. Jesus at the center of your finances. A lot of us, we like to do everything else, but Lord, we say, Lord, you cannot touch our finances. We really don't say that, but our actions. Jesus is the center of it all. He's the center of the church. He is the vine and we are the branches. The true vine implies that there are other ways. When Jesus said, I am the true vine, what he was implying is that I am it. There is possible possibility of other vines out there, but they are the counterfeits. And who is the biggest counterfeit out there? The devil himself. He comes to confuse us and distract us and show us false sources of life that is not true. 
distracting us. Many of Jesus' listeners believed that they were connected to God by being part of Israel. The vine. But Jesus says, I love this passage when Jesus tries to always, you know, they're thinking a certain way and then he sets them straight. <laughs> the, the word. In this is John chapter 1 verse 13 it says, so Jesus says, we are God's children. Reborn. Not with a physical birth resulting from human passion and pain, but a birth that comes from God. Amen. Don't you love that? So it's not because you were born a Jew, not because you were born in Israel, not because of that. Yes, they had it at the center of their holy place and the symbol of the true vine and they understood the concept in that and everything. But that's what they were thinking. That's what they were struggling with. Remember Peter when he, even after he, he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and even after he gave that amazing message and that Bible says that 3,000 people were added to the church that day. He still had to be confronted by Paul when he was not understanding about the Gentiles and, and the food and, and the cultures and traditions. He was confronted with that. And he understood after that. And so he was, he, they were so focused on this, but Jesus was trying to let them know it's not because of culture, traditions. Some of us may say that. Some of us might understand that or even believe in that at times. We say, well, you know what, this is our culture. This is our tradition. This is what we've been doing from the beginning of time in this church or that church or we did this at that church. But it's not so. It's like, what is the Lord saying to us today? And he says, if you are connected with Jesus and you, they are connected to the true vine, then you are God's children. You are born of the Spirit. That's why it says reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion and plan, but a birth that comes from God. Some people think they are saved because they were born in America, it's a Christian country. Take it for granted. Or because we joined a church, we started going to church, or because they do great deeds. But it's actually by faith in Jesus Christ that connects us to the Father. And we are saved by grace. Any other way but God's way in Christ will not lead to spiritual growth in him. Jesus alone is a true source and the life that results from being connected to him. Are you connected to God through the vine, through the true vine, Jesus Christ? Here's God's promise to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, gave the right to become what? The children of God. Hallelujah. You are a son and daughter of the Most High God. Yes. Amen. Yes. You should be rejoicing for that. When we receive him, we believe in his name. New life results from being connected with Jesus and the true vine. But here's a third lesson from the vine that we read in this passage. And this is one of the hardest parts of it, I believe. Third point is remaining in Christ produces change or produces fruit. There is a relationship between our remaining in Christ and our producing of fruit. Jesus refers to the importance of remaining in him at least six times in these eight verses, if you read it. Remain in me, and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. So what's he saying? He's saying that means it's so important. All of this stuff is great. 
I believe, I understand, but we don't remain in him. We don't stay connected. That does not bring change. Because when you actually see, you know, when I, when I go out to the, our backyard, we have a few fruit trees there. They're bearing fruit. And as they're bearing fruit, avocados, lemons, figs, guavas, and all that stuff, I have never heard a tree say, come on tree, you got bare fruit. I never heard a tree say, well, come on fruit, you gotta grow bigger. <laughs> they just, there. They're rooted, they're grounded in the soil. As a matter of fact, some of the trees sometimes, Cheryl's got them in pots and, and they're in a shaded area and there's, there's one plant the other day, uh, a week ago, she brought it out because it started to bend like this and then curve because it was looking for sunlight. And it started going for sunlight. Looking for light, a tree. How much more we who are created in the image of God in his likeness to look out and search for the light because we are rooted and grounded and we are attached to the vine, church. We miss that. We are not remaining in it. And I tell you what, that part she brought it out within one week, it's up straight now. I kid you not. It's straight that's why, because it's rooted, it's getting the nutrients, it's drinking the water, it's getting the sunlight, it is flourishing because it's staying connected. It does not say all of a sudden, well, you know what, Cheryl might move it around from place to place, different parts, but they don't decide to say, you know what, I'm done with Conrad's backyard, I'm going to go to my neighbor's backyard. <laughs> that would be weird if that happens. And I don't see that happening. What I've seen though, driving down Ash, Ashwood last week or Friday coming to church, there were a lot of trees in a person's yard and there I see them completely cut down to the stump. I'm like, what? Big trees. I don't know the reason behind it, but they didn't move. They were rooted. But they were brought down, maybe because they're not, you know, alive anymore. There's a relationship between remaining in Christ and producing fruit. To remain in Him is to see fruit produced in your life. Not to remain in Him is to remove yourself, ouch, from the source of life. And to a possibility to wither and die. To bring several questions up in our Christian life. I'm going to read to you something that I just read to the church council yesterday. And I quote, Pastor Tony Evans, if you've heard of who he is, made this quote. He says, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Some of you are like, yes, the Lord. Tony Evans quoted that. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And they are right. Salvation is through faith alone and in Christ alone. But for those of you who are married, for that was my, my saying. And he says, you also don't have to go home to be married. Stay away, stay away long enough and your relationship will be affected. There's some deep truth to that. can stay connected to the vine and you produce fruit and you'll be alive. So the Bible says in Hebrews 10.25 Paul's writing and saying 
It says, forsake not the gathering of yourselves. I tell you what, the enemy is such a dece deceiver and liar and, and a cheater. If he can cheat you out of connecting with other believers, to connecting with them and understanding and just be encouraged, it's only once a week, he will do it. Ah, oh, you worked hard this week. <laughs> Long hours. You deserve yourself a nice hot bathtub. Stay connected. Because he's, Jesus, Paul writes and says, he says, especially when the day of his return draws near. Yes. And I tell you, church, I, 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 I'm not listening to a lot of news, but I catch things here and there, and I get certain, I only uh, subscribe to uh, a Christian, faith-based Christian um, news source, and they give you pretty up-to-date good news. And I just read through them. And I tell you what, this is why on Wednesday night when we were praying, the, the Lord just, we were in, in deep prayer, and all of a sudden the Lord just spoke to me, and he says, an awakening resilience. Awakening resilience. And it's not because, you know, oh, the culture in America and around the world right now, this woke culture, it's not because all of a sudden we were asleep and we were awakened or we awoke. It's not that. And it's not about that with the Christian faith either. It is just an awakening in your spirit to realizing and saying, God, I see your return fast approaching. And I got to be right. I got to be plugged in with you. I got to be stay connected with you because I do not want to miss out. I can't do that. But there's all of these things that are happening around me, the circumstances and the, the trials and the financial stuff and my sickness and my family and restoration. You, you know, our families are not getting together and things that, all of this happening, Lord, how do I stay strong? Rooted and grounded that this passage that Miriam read this morning. Connected to the vine. He says, you stay connected and I'll take care of the stuff. The stuff that needs to be pruned out of your life, that sickness that needs to be pruned out, that is, that is stopping the flow of the blessing so that you may be healed and that you may bear fruit. I will take care of that. I'll cut it out. Prune it out. Yes. You didn't realize that, right? That's what he would be doing. Or that financial struggle, he says, I'm going to prune that so that you would flourish. That you bear more fruit. What does it mean for us to remain in him? To remain in Jesus means that discipleship, your life in Christ, is not a passive process we are a part of a process of seeing fruit produced to remain and to abide in Christ it's interesting over here when I was looking up the words the language used in the words remain in me and I remain in you means to continue in a relationship that has already been established. When you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you are in him. And yes, sometimes we may fall off and that does not mean we think it says, just continue, just continue in him, come back to him. Jesus is talking to the people who, who are in him, the disciples, they already knew this. He reminds them, he says in verse 3, you I have already pruned and purified by the message that I have given you. What did he do? He says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Remember the times that he spent time with 
the disciples and he was speaking to them and teaching them that I am in the Father and, and the Father is in me. And he's showing them stuff and praying and teaching them how to pray. So here's the interesting point. This is what is he saying over this? He says, I have already pruned you. I've cleaned you. And is what? By what? And purified you. Verse 3. I have already pruned. I've been pruned and purified. By what? The message I have given you. So here's the key. So what does that mean? That if you're pruned and you're cleaned, that means the word of God is the washing of your soul, the spirit of God that is upon you, that you go before the Lord, you stay connected and allow his words to come. He said, I am in the vine. I am connected with Jesus Christ. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. He is my healer. He is my Rafa. He is my provider. That is what we declare. It is the washing of the word that begins to prune away the areas of our lives to give us more fruit. In other words, you're already clean, Jesus said, because of the word I have spoken to you. So if you feel at times unclean or struggling, not my words, but Jesus' words, that means you need the word. John chapter 15 verse 3 says that in the New King James and I love it. He says You've already clean, you, you are already clean because of the word I have, of which I have spoken to you. So that means it's not our circumstances or situations that cause us to get to come before the Lord and, uh, and say, yes, it does bring us to him. But it is actually the word of God that cleanses us and fixes our situations and circumstances. But we do it the opposite way sometimes. The words clean and prune have the same meaning in the text. Signifying that they were already clean by the words that Jesus has spoken over you. You are in a living relationship with God and the Father through Jesus Christ. Jesus is not saying I want you to keep on establishing a relationship with me. It's just saying that connect with me. Just stay connected. You don't have to constantly keep reestablishing your relationship with them. I remember as a kid when I was growing up, boy, Sunday nights at Assemblies of God Church, they would call revival meetings. And every night I was getting saved. <laughs> every night I would be at the altars crying and saying, God, forgive me. It was not taught properly that time. Yes, but you know, in those days, the time, the season, whatever it is, God was faithful in all of that. But he says, yeah, you're not reestablishing a relationship with me. God is saying, continue in the relationship that has already been begun. Stay active and imperative. And it is so important in our lives. <laughs> For example, if you're married... And I say, remain in that marriage. You come to me for counseling. What I'm saying to you is that, I'm not saying to you that become married again or get remarried. You're already married, right? You're already in a relationship. What I'm saying is continue in the state and develop the relationship. So important. That's what Jesus is saying to us. Remain in me and continue following me. Develop this relationship that has begun. That I am in the Father and the Father's in me. But in you stay connected to the vine as the branches. You will bear fruit. If we will do that, we will bear much fruit. Branches never strive to bear fruit 
Like I said, I don't hear the branches on my trees yelling out, come on, uh, avocados, push out. <laughs> the day I hear that, I'm like, I rebuke your tree. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, they don't say that. They don't. They just connect it. They produce fruit. The job is to remain to the vine. So easy. So, so easy, church. Come on. You just got to stay connected to Jesus and the source, the life source. And that's all that is. And you will bear fruit. You will see results in your life. Secondly, this is a sub point in point number three, I think it was, or four that I gave you. Three. Three. What kind of fruit can we expect to see when we remain in Christ? It is important because Jesus said in verse 8, when you produce much fruit, you are my disciples. This brings great glory to the Father. So if you're not bearing fruit, that means not bringing glory to the Father. It is important because God's kind of fruit makes the difference in our daily life. Listen, bearing fruit brings increase. Did you hear me? Bearing fruit brings increase. When you put an avocado tree down, all the branches begin to think you get in the first few years, it takes five, seven years to bear fruit. You may get three, four of them, but as it grows bigger and the branches, you trim it, you get more fruit. It increases. I love the story about the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. Go home and read it. The story is told there of the, the master who's about to leave town and go, and he calls the servants and he gives them Ten talents, five talents, and one talent. Right? Remember that story? And he goes, and then when he returns back, he tells them, before he leaves, he says, multiply, increase. When he comes back, the guy with the ten gave him, and he had increased what he had what he had been given, and the five had increased. But the guy with the one, he's like, says he brought back that same one talent and he gave it back to the Lord, to the master of the house. And he said, what happened? The question was, you didn't do anything with it. He says, oh no, I was afraid if I put it in the stock market like the S&P index or the, or the Dow 500 or two days ago dropped by 20%, you could have lost that, even that one that you had. So I give it to you back. Let me just tell you something. God is looking for increase. The reason Jesus says that sto- shares that story is because he knows that you must bear fruit. It is important that we bear fruit. And if, it is, and if, see, if God is looking for increase and bearing fruit, it matters to God. So it better matter to us if we are connected to him. bear much fruit it is the truth that likes that like begets like meaning Christians beget other Christians so in one sense the fruit produced through us is other Christians but the fruit is not limited in producing other Christians in the New Testament Paul talks about this the fruit of the Spirit, spiritual fruits, results in our relationship with Jesus Christ. The spiritual fruit is most clearly described in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. It says, but the Holy Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. If you're connected to the vine and, and you're the branch, then as you're connected to Jesus... You will bear fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, (laughs) self-control. And there is no law against these things, Paul writes. This is the list of nine qualities 
is a representative of the kind of fruit that is produced through believers in relationship with Jesus Christ when we are connected to him. The picture of fruit of the Holy Spirit is found simply by observing the life of Jesus Christ as you walk it out, as you walk in Christ. So the question to me to ask is, is my life, is my life exhibiting the fruit of Christ? Am I becoming more loving? Am I becoming more patient? Am I becoming more kind? Am I becoming more merciful, gracious, compassionate? Is there peace in my house? Hmm, important things. Jesus demonstrated these and more in his life. He was asleep on the boat in the middle of the storm. Even though the disciples were afraid and they thought they were going to die, he just got up and he spoke, peace be still. Because he was the prince of peace. Is there peace at home? This is the measure of our lives as Christians as we walk it out, as we go through daily life. It is important. Why is it so important to know? Because we learn bearing fruit is building our relationship stronger with the Father that others, Jesus says, that others will know that you are my disciples. So when you come together, you'll say like, wow, we eat of each other's fruit. We are nourished and encouraged as we gather together and we fellowship together and we worship the Lord together in unity. We are doing this together. Jesus says, what you do to others, you are doing to him. And it is also true that what you do to others, you are also doing it. Not only to others, but to yourself. For we are all members of the body of Christ. So you can't say, I'm just doing it for them. No, you're part of the body of Christ. It's important to understand that concept because if you're connected to the vine and you're the branch, there's another branch on that way, there's another branch here, you're connected, you're part of the body of Christ and so you're doing it yourself. So when you love others, you are loving yourself. When you're gracious to others, you're being gracious to yourself. Now if you're a branch and if you are connected with Christ, the true vine, you are connected with other fellow Christians also. However, the flip side of that, if you criticize your brother or sister, you tear them down. Or you speak evil of them. And you are affecting, or you're in a way, hacking your life or your limb because you're connected to the vine, the source. Point number four, the last point. God prunes us in order to conform to his character. You cannot, cannot abide in the vine and the branches cannot be pruned. You have to allow it to be pruned so that there's a character that is being built up. The vine cannot produce a crop which it is capable of producing without regular pruning. Fruitful branches are pruned. It's like, wow, why? I'm bearing fruit, I'm doing so good, I'm doing all this in church and I'm, I'm doing all of that stuff, but here comes pastor and he says, He's cutting something out. Or the Lord comes in and he says, the Lord spoke something and he's, and he's pruning something out. It's not because to kill the branch. Pruning doesn't take place to kill the branch. It is to produce even more fruit. Fruitful branches are pruned. While our part in the process of discipleship is to remain in Christ, and this is the hardest part, like I said, 
continue to remain in Christ because when you're remaining in Christ, there comes a pruning. God's part is pruning away in our lives all that God sees in us that is not wanted. So in essence, we are being pruned and conformed to the character of Jesus Christ. Day by day in our lives, if it's not happening, we need to take a look at ourselves. Spiritual fruit is produced and maximized in our life over time through the process of spiritual pruning. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he trims, cleans, so that it bears much fruit. But the branches that are sitting, even though it be however little, they may be however big, that are not bearing much fruit, is pruned and is cut away, actually, the Bible says, and cast into the fire. Cleansing. Cleansing of all the diseases and impurities in our thoughts, in our mindsets, in our, in our character, in our walk with the Lord. If cleaning, spiritual pruning means removing that which is diseased and harmful in your spiritual growth, that's a good thing. And sometimes it happens, right? Surgeons go in and remove stuff cancer cells and things of that way that is not good in your body, how much more if you're connected to the body of Christ and there's some area in our lives that has to be pruned, God is the one who determined this Father. He's the gardener. He is committed to do the pruning in your life and mine. Pruning of anger, bitterness, impatience, unmerciful, unloving, cultural and judicial spirits in us. All dead branches that ruin us, our relationships with people and others have to be removed. It's a good thing. But if you don't let God work in your life and respond to his judgment, which spiritual pruning is a form of, you're going back around that track again. Remember what happened to the children of Israel. Forty years was supposed to take only a few days. Remember, he told Pharaoh, he says, let my people go, Moses said, that they may go into the wilderness and they may offer a sacrifice and pray to me. It was supposed to be only for a few days, 40 years. They did not learn. It was a pruning, it was a thing. And a whole generation was wiped out. And the new generation saw the promise of God in Canaan the promised land. My question is, how long, God? How long? God says, until you get it. Until you get it. Until we understand. It took 40 years for Israel, but he is doing the pruning in our lives. No pruning means no life. No life. So maybe there is not much fruit in our lives. In our lives, we may see or may sense. But there's still a little bit of life left somewhere underneath that God says. It's not dead yet, but it's still your spiritual life is dormant and it is going to come. And we, we were praying um, I don't know if it was on Wednesday or things that it's like it sense that also we may be in a winter season but what oh it was at, at our council meeting yesterday maybe in a winter season but the joy of the Lord the spring is coming spring is coming 
in our spiritual lives, in the life of this church, in summer, then comes summer, but then after that comes the harvest. And I want you to see that because I want you to go back to what the Lord is saying to us in this church, in this moment, in this time that he's saying, going back to Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, he says, do you not see, forget the former things, forget the past, do you not see I'm doing a new thing, I'm going to create roads in the deserts and rivers and dry wastelands. So in closing, I want to read to you I love this anal analogy and I'm going to read to you this analogy. Pay attention to it. When God wanted to create fish, he spoke to the sea. When God wanted to create trees, he spoke to the earth. But when God wanted to create man, he turned to himself and then God said, let us make man in our own image and our own likeness. So if you take the fish out of water, it will die. When you remove a tree from the soil, it will also die. Likewise, when man is disconnected from God, he dies. God is our natural environment. We were created to live in his presence. We have to be connected to him because it is only in him that life exists. Let me say this again. It is only in him when we are connected to him and because of him that life exists. Let us stay connected to God. Because if you recall, we recall that water without fish is still water. But fish without water is nothing. The soil without tree is still soil. But the tree without soil is nothing. God without man is still God. But man without God is nothing. Jesus says, so which one it will be living way family? Jesus says, the one who remains in me produces much fruit. Yes. 